Hey everyone, my guest today is the actor, author, comedian, and director Michael Ian Black. On television, Michael has starred in The Jim Gaffigan Show and Comedy Central's Another Period. He reprised his role in Wet Hot American Summer 10 years later, previously starred in Wet Hot American Summer First Day of Camp. He has three stand-up comedy specials with albums? I don't know. Maybe a hundred. No, three, or three, 100. three sounds right. About three. Um... You also starred in um, the sitcom Ed on NBC with yeah. Tom Cavanaugh. He has authored 11 books. Could be. Could be. Um, Michael hosts a podcast called How to Be Amazing. And, of course, sketch comedy fans know him from The State, Viva Variety, Stella, and Michael and Michael Have Issues. Some of his movie roles, and <sighs> I mean just some, just some. Probably all. I'm mm -hmm. almost in no movies. <laughs> I took one off. Oh, <laughs> you, see if you remember what it is, or people can call in. Hell, oh, baby. Yeah. This is forty. Take me home tonight. Reno nine one one Miami, and the Baxter. Mm -hmm. All right. You wrote and directed the film Wedding Days, and you co-wrote the comedy run Fat Boy Run. I David did, Schwimmer directed that. I did those things. Um, Michael hosts, as I said earlier, a podcast called How to Be Amazing. And I say this, dear listeners, with with real truth. After I listened to it today, I was like, oh, I don't know if I really need to do this anymore. Because you're doing it. You're doing my dream. Which is what? I mean, you're doing it too. You're, we're both doing it. We're doing the same exact thing. Yes. But yours teaches everyone how to be amazing. Ah. And at the end of the day, it's not what we all really but want. But it's just a catchy title. It is. Um. Actually, full disclosure, I I had been thinking of calling my podcast How to Be Amazing, and that's how I found yours. Is that true? Yeah. I thought, that. Well, what if it's like really what I want is just like to have all these people who inspire me, and if they can just share their story, because they're all amazing, that's why they're on the show, much like yourself, um, and if they can share anything that might help the rest of us feel a little bit like we have a shot at being amazing... That's so that funny that you, thing. that you had that title. I yeah. I didn't think of that title. Who found it for you? Did uh, I? No, I'm going to name drop. <laughs> okay. M my producers. Barack uh, Obama. <laughs> <laughs> my producers, uh, Jenny and Mary and I were trying to conceptualize this podcast. And uh, and we were also trying to figure out if we could make any money doing a podcast. And we had a meeting, a kind of informational meeting with Ira Glass. And he asked what the podcast was about. And we said, and then he said, well, what's the title? And we were sort of didn't really know. And he said, well, it sounds like a How to Be Amazing podcast. And then I said, oh, can we Done. take that? And he said, sure. See, I was either going to call it How to Be Amazing or your previous idea was How Do You Make Any Money Doing a Podcast? Right. Both were taken. And uh, have did have you made any money doing a podcast? Yeah. What? Why am I not making any money doing a podcast? Well, because you didn't name it how to make money doing. Right. You have to be very meta right, about right, the whole right, thing. Right. No, the great thing is, and and this is really the truth. This is um and and everything that starts out as a passion project um makes a lot of money is <laughs> the opposite <laughs> <laughs> of a money making scheme so i don't have one entrepreneurial bone in my body i have zero talent um, but I have tremendous talent when it comes to attracting people I admire into this room with me. So it's going great mm. in terms of that. Bills are not being paid. Right. Food is not being eaten. That's right. Um, but there's a lot of love. I have love. Uh, in the end, look, that's love all that all really matters. Need. So Michael Ian Black, great name. I'm a big fan of people with three names. I've had many actors on this show with three names. I don't like it. I wouldn't have never have done it. I never would have chosen it. Who was Michael? Well, but am I? But the men in black, like, oh, I was, hate that so much. Really? Of course. Mm -hmm. Only because when you have a thing that people can point to and think that they're being original, original, and hilarious, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then it it never stops. Matthew Broderick, to drop a name, he did not give me the name of this podcast, but when he was on the show recently, he was saying how just as he was walking into the studio, the very steps you just walked on yourself. I had no idea that was the hallowed ground that Matthew Broderick himself had trod. Someone said to him, Bueller? Oh, no. And he was like, yep. 
I guess that's the correct response. <laughs> and the guy's like, wait, was I not the first? He's like, no, not the first. <laughs> no, but it's very funny and it's Aww. great. And, and guess what? Yes. Yes, I am. Right. I just know it. I, I, I mean, I guess I hadn't put myself in Matthew Broderick's shoes up until this moment. Mm. But in thinking about it, of course, of course he gets Bueller. Yeah. Bueller. And how maddening that must be after 30 or 35 years. Yeah. I mean, he's done a couple of other things. Yeah. But, but the, 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 the Bueller just lends itself to that. Well, I, it's fun to say. It's not like somebody's going, Guy and Godzilla? <laughs> Guy and Godzilla? Yeah. But Which is his other have... best known credit. Yes, yes. Um, war, <laughs> war games. Um, I want to be a producer. They probably do that too. Sometimes. Sometimes. You had a moment early in your life, I would imagine. Uh, I'm going to segue so gracefully away from the great Matthew Broderick and shine my light right back on the great Michael Ian Black, who does not. I'll just call you Michael Black then, or Michael yeah. Schwartz, as was your original name. Yes, that is name. my birth name, um, my birthed does name. Does anyone on the planet call you that? Michael Schwartz? Yeah, my my uh, my old friends, some of them do. Uh, what does it say on your driver's license? Michael Black, Michael Ian Black. That okay. is my name now. It's legal. It's le- legally my name. So your children's last name? Is Black. Okay. Part of the reason... Uh, I legally changed it is because my wife's name is Martha. And when we were getting married, she was terrified that she would be known as Mrs. Marty Schwartz. Now, why would that terrify her? I think it's a very elegant, lovely name. She's a, you know, she's my height. She's almost six feet tall and blonde and and nobody could look less like a Marty Schwartz. But that's why it's funny. Yes, and that's why my dear uh, friends often call her Marty Schwartz. Just to... Yeah, just to stick the knife in a little bit. Yeah, so that's what a good friend does. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I I think she likes it now because it's not really her name. But she said she wouldn't have changed her name. I mean, she she hyphenated. uh, She did take black. She she, Yeah, she's uh, Hagen Black uh, because her main name is Hagen. That would make sense. Yes. So when we go back to Michael... Ian Black, before he legally became Michael Ian Black, at some point as a kid, you realized that you were interested in performing. Mm -hmm. When did that begin for you? Summer camp. I was nine. And I don't know why I decided to be in the camp play. Was it Sleepaway or Day Camp? It was Sleepaway. I think it was because there was a girl that I liked who was in the play. So were you not Sporty Spice as a kid? I wasn't not. I mean, I played a lot of baseball, and I felt comfortable playing sports. Uh, It was never like a tremendous... Well, I shouldn't even say that. I mean, as a nine-year-old, yes, I was passionately invested in baseball, in playing baseball. Um, But then I started doing plays, and a couple years later, my mom basically gave me a choice because she didn't want to drive me around. She was like, you can either do Little League or you can do a play. And I was like, I'll do the play. And this was in? New Jersey. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Geographic. You're asking for geographical information. Yeah. A little bit. Right. So you grew up in New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey. I'm oh, from yeah? Teaneck. Okay. Do you know where that is? Vaguely. And you're from? Hillsboro. And did you spend your whole childhood there? Um, the, 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 the great majority of it, yes. And were either of your parents artistic? Uh, no. No. But supportive of you? Hmm. Were you listening to like <laughs> cast albums? Were you? No. Did you come into? The, I mean, you had some. No, I wasn't like proximity a, to New York City. Yeah, uh, and I de- one of the one of the gifts that my mom gave us was she and her partner Arlene. Uh, my mom was gay. Um, I'm glad because Arlene is like a terrible a guy's terrible name. name for a guy. Worse than Marty Schwartz. Yes. Uh, they liked theater and they would take us to Bucks County Playhouse in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And I saw a lot of musicals there. And it, I, uh, I love doing musicals, but I can't sing and I can't dance. Is that right? Yeah. So have you done a lot of musicals? No, because I can't sing nor can I dance. But when I was a kid and you wanted, one wanted to do theater, it's like that's kind of what you did. Yeah. Uh, that, that those were there, there weren't a lot of productions of Equus around that you would cast yourself in, and so. Uh, but there should have been. <laughs> in point of fact, I was in a production of Equus when Children's I was fifteen years theater old. Children's theater producer. Well, I went to note. Stage Door Manor, which you oh. probably know of. Yes. 
the 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 theater camp for uh, precocious children, and I was I was in a production of Equus. Who were some of the people who might still be acting that were in you who are alumna around the same time as you? Josh Charles, uh-huh. the actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jonathan Mark Sherman, the playwright. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alexander Chaplin, the actor. I know him well. Uh, He'll be so happy that you just mentioned him. Yeah, in fact, I think I got a text from him within the last day or so that I ignored uh, n- through no through no fault of his, but I think I just was... Uh, well, that would be all on you, actually. It would not be a fault of his if you did not respond. Well, how dare he text me? <laughs> how, he's how also very dare funny. He? He's a very funny oh, person. Oh, he's... Far funnier uh, than I will ever be, far more verbally dexterous than maybe anybody I know, Um, impossibly so. And you know many verbally dexterous people, so that is high praise. I do. Um, The difference between Alexander Chaplin and the other people is the other people can also be quiet. Mm. And Sandy, as he is known, Mm -hmm. cannot Right. Right. <laughs> Sandy, are you listening? <laughs> we may take this out just because he's he's innocent in all of this. No, how di- again, how, how dare, dare he, he text me? Okay, so another mutual friend who is at the camp with you uh is whom? I th- oh, so I'm Her- saying oh, right, so that Seth was Herzog, Sandy. who you probably you must know. Yep. Uh the com- New York City based comedian. Uh uh, I know I'm forgetting people. So, so Summers, Summers at Beanie Feldstein, who you probably know, was just on this show. I know the name. I don't she know. was in Lady Bird and and a wonderful movie that's oh, out that's now. Oh, that's who she and, is. Yes, yes I know exactly who she is. Just she, finished was running she a Hello Dolly. Kid? Yes, and she was telling me all about like oh. I was like, was it competitive? And she was like, no, it's yes, yes, it, yes. <laughs> oh, she's much younger than me. That's why. Yeah, I don't yeah, know no, her. she could be our child. Um, Wait, are we having a child? <laughs> so that's the oh other thing God. when you come on this show. It's two things. We kind of like, it's not about promoting a specific project. We talk about your life in its entirety and we have a baby. Wow. I mean. Is that weird? I know. I'm thrilled. I'm My honestly husband a little actually thrilled. loves it. Yeah. He was like, it's not just a podcast. <laughs> oh, got it. It's a pee in a podcast. It's a pee in a podcast. It isn't making money, but it's making babies. <laughs> which is even better, the which world is costing needs, money. The world needs more babies. Yeah. Um, so when you were at Stage Door, Man- Stage Door Manor, as Beanie was describing to me, some people like were kind of the stars yeah. of the summer and and some were not. Right. Where were you? I was a star. It's the only place in my in my life I've ever been a star, and it was really only for one summer. What? Tell us about that summer, because that's a big summer. Well, I was there for two years, and the first that's year, it? yeah, that's all I was there for. Because mm-hmm. um, I went, I started going late when I was, you know, I was getting right up to the age where it would be inappropriate to go to summer camp anymore. Right, you could almost be a counselor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, now I had a distinct advantage because, as a semi-straight acting dude, with lesbian moms, right. At theater camp, you're going to well, just as a guy in summer camp. Uh, I mean, at theater camp, you're going to do well because it's probably a two or three to one ratio of girls to guys. Right. So they're always looking for guys. And then I was a little older, which is helpful. I mean, you know, fifteen, sixteen. You could play Tevya. <laughs> I could play Tevya <laughs> or Doctor Richard Martin Dysart. What's his name? In, yeah. Martin yeah. Dysart in uh, in Equus. Richard. Is it Richard? Well, Richard. Wait, didn't Richard Dysart? Oh, that's the actor, Martin it. Dysart. Yeah. Dysart? They're both dead. Please continue. Uh, so that summer, that second summer that I was there, after they kind of knew me, I was yeah, I was in Equus and I was the Pirate King in Pirates of Penzance. My probably my last musical that I've done. That's amazing. And so it you doesn't got to require do that. that much singing. No, but you got to have like swagger. Oh, I got so I had so much swagger, and uh, yeah, and I I think I won awards. It's the only time in my life I've ever won awards for like anything. Like a Tony, you got yeah. a Tony. I got the stage door Tony. <laughs> And uh, that that's that is when I peaked. That summer is when I peaked. Sixteen and years old. Do you think that feeling of getting to do this thing that you love uh, and people loving you for it um, is that maybe where the the drive to maybe think of this as a profession? Oh no, no, no! I that knew that was at nine. Oh, that was that was at nine. No, I knew at nine. Did you see a movie like Chaz Palminteri was just here? He's like, you know, I saw Around the World in Eighty Days, and I'm like, I'm going to do that. No, I had. Did a mo- you see Around the World in Eighty Days? No, I haven't either. <laughs> but I had the whole conversation with him, like, yeah, 
<laughs> no, that that the technicolor well, what, alone. A lot of times what I do is when people tell me something that they've seen or read, I just nod and then I feel terrible and I say I'm nodding, but I don't I haven't seen that because I feel like I'm lying. Mm. And I and although I'm I'm just not that comfortable lying. In general? In general. That's a great quality. Mm. That's but, all right. It's I mean, right. maybe maybe it gets you in trouble sometimes. No, uh, you're not mean about it. I don't think so. You're not I a mean not. truth teller. I I, don't, I mean, I can I mean I can say uh, like Alana, it's great to be here. <laughs> like I can say that with a straight face. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, but are you nodding even though you you haven't no, read it's it? It's so great to be here. Why? <laughs> Why is it so great to be here? So far, what is great about being so far? Here? The best part is your Van Halen sweatshirt. By far. By far. Not the spit take that I just did. No, but that was a really good spit take. Yeah. But I felt like I earned it. Um, I No, I, I can tell you the moment. I mean, I remember it exactly. I was nine. I was doing this play. and What was the play? I don't know. I don't. It wasn't even like a real play. It was like some sort of like... Made up play. Kind of. Yeah, I think it was. But And I had probably a tiny role. I was nine and I had to go from upstage to downstage. And something happened on my four foot movement where I tripped while singing and kind of fell and kind of recovered and in that moment continued doing what I was doing. And for some reason, it was that moment, that moment of, 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 of I think, feeling powerful in a way because, I, because even though I had fallen, I was still sort of in control and controlling what was, what, how I was presenting myself and what was happening. Uh, that was the moment where I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. Well, what an amazing thing. Like, even as a metaphor, the idea of falling and having the wherewithal to figure out how to get up yeah. in front of an audience, that is a powerful thing. So were you one of the only people you knew? There are a lot of kids in my children's class who have two moms or two dads. That was not true when I was growing up. And I wonder, when you were growing up, were you the only one who oh, had yeah. two moms? Oh, yeah. God, yeah. So your parents were divorced? My parents were divorced. Um, you have a brother? I have a brother and a sister. I think I read that in some notes, yeah. Uh-huh. And, uh, oh, you have and a sister. So I where are you? I have a sister. I'm in the middle. Okay. Oh. And um, yeah, having gay parents was not a thing. That was not something that one did. That was not uh, in vogue, as they say. And was... Your mom, your mom and Arlene, mm-hmm. are they still together? No. Okay. Were they out? Or did people think like, you know, my parents are divorced and my mom has a roommate? It was like they were neither out nor in. They were uh, they were in the shadows. Um, but if you had like a parent-teacher conference. It would have been my mom. It would not have been Arlene. Um, no, I mean, they were... No, they weren't they weren't really out as a couple but they weren't really hiding it either. It was just sort of and the, and and the and we lived in a very we lived in a in a little townhouse in New Jersey surrounded by neighbors. I mean, it's not like it, there was no mystery to anybody, but nobody talked about it and we didn't talk about it to them. So everybody was just kind of turning a blind eye. But would your mom and Arlene walk around holding hands? No. So they were private. Yeah. Yeah. How old were you when they got together? 5. You're really little. Yeah. So you probably, do you it, remember much before that? Not really. I mean, my parents didn't get along. I remember that. And I remember that my mom was then with Arlene. and uh, But I didn't think anything of it. I mean, I wasn't old enough to be aware that it was weird other than this was a person who was not my parent. Right. The way I think any kid would. What's the age difference between you and your siblings? My brother is almost two years older, and my sister is about a year and a half younger. And are they really funny also? Uh, no. Okay. Are they super smart? My brother is. My sister has Down syndrome, uh, so I would not say she's super smart. Uh, my brother's funny. I mean, yeah, he's, he has a good sense of humor, but he's, he's an actuary. Well, that's funny. Yeah, that's some funny stuff. And uh, so, no, I wouldn't say they're particularly funny. Right, but you grew up with... I wouldn't say I'm particularly funny. N- well... I mean, I re- I, 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 I'm not even being self-deprecating. Michael, I mean that did in... you watch yourself recently no. on Colbert? No. Really? I didn't. Okay. Well, I suggest to you and everyone listening 
that you Google right. or YouTube Michael Ian Black on on uh, a, a March 2018 episode think, of The Late like, Show with he's, he's, Colbert. It was earlier. It was? Yeah, it might have, like maybe December or January. Okay, I watched it in March. Yeah, in preparing for this. Which, <laughs> so just... I mean, I, I appreciate that you prepared. Oh, I spent hours. I, I also read the book that you wrote about your relationship with your wife. Uh-huh. And I said to my husband, if I could write, and if I wrote a book write, about... You that love letter to my wife. I would write in your voice <laughs> that you have my exact brand of funny which well, is a very intoxicating thing in a read. Well, that's kind of it, you. It, um, I mean, you've written many books for children and adults. Um, I suggest the, the the sort of memoir about your relationship be read by adults, right. but the kids na- might enjoy the it too. name, which you do not even recall. What is the name of the book? Like, How to Be Amazing <laughs> as a Husband? That book is called You're Not Doing It Right. That's right. You're Not Doing It oh, Right. Oh, I know. No, I know it's right. Is it, know. No, you're <laughs> But that's right. I read it a long time ago because we were supposed to do this a long time ago. I apologize. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, but I, I had the magical thing happen where, where Kismet and, and Serendipity all, all get married, which is I was doing laundry in my building. And my building has sort of a, a lovely thing where people bring books that they're done with to oh. the laundry room and kind of we do a little book swap. Literally had been like emailing you, when can we do it? Well, I'm going to Canada. And somebody dropped and someone my had, book into the laundry had chute. Finished, <laughs> had finished it and wanted to share it <laughs> is more how I think about it. And uh, and I thought, wow, here's his book. Right. That's Dude, that's crazy. Not even bargain bin. Laundry room. No, free. <laughs> free, exactly. <laughs> I recently, Peter Hedges, the magnificent, he wrote What's Eating Gilbert Grape and a million things. I was in like a like a dollar store. And the screenplay for Pieces of April, hmm. his wonderful indie film, was like in the 99 cent store. And I was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. So I like sent him a picture of it. Like, oh, my God, you're in the... And then I was like, that probably made him feel awful. Right. It probably wasn't like a great feeling for him. Right. For me, I was like, he's so famous. Right. That his book... Is they're... worthless. Is essentially <laughs> worthless. He doesn't need money. <laughs> he's got fame. Which would you choose, money or fame? I don't want fame. No? No. Okay. Money, every time. Mm. Every single time. Fame is worthless Mm. and annoying. Okay. Uh, I say that as somebody who is only marginally famous, but I can sense from the better known people that I have been around that it's the worst. Matthew Broderick walking up, Bueller, Bueller. You don't want to deal with that 800 times a day. On your city bike. Right. You don't want that. No, but every time someone says Bueller, he gets one million dollars. Oh, <laughs> so I mean Bueller, ka-ching. that's amazing. Yeah, and now he has to essentially split that with you because you're having his baby. Yeah, twins. <laughs> wow, <laughs> congratulations! This is so stupid. I don't know why I said that <laughs> and where it's going, but somehow I feel like there's a cease and desist letter coming my way. Um. You finished summer camp. You are a star. You decide to go to college. Do mm-hmm. you major in being an actor? Yeah. I went to NYU, and the major was literally called Be an Actor. And I dropped out after two years. Why? Um, because I needed to get out. I just felt, well, first of all, I got a job opportunity to be a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Which I that know, doesn't happen every day. No, it doesn't. Um, and what not? It, they, they were doing a touring show of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and a friend of mine and I got the opportunity to be <laughs> promotional turtles, like Javits Center no, turtles. No, we no bigger, bigger than Javits. No, much smaller. We would travel ahead of the touring show and do the promotions at the Pizza Huts or the weather, the new, local news. And you felt that rather than, you know, a liberal arts education along with a a BA. Uh, Would have been a BFA. A BFA, pardon me. Life skills. What I felt was somebody's going to pay me to travel across the country, uh, to drive across the country in a van with my friend. Who was the friend? His name's Ben Grant. He is one of the uh, co-creators and stars of Reno 911. He wrote uh, Night at the Museum, co-wrote Night at the Museum, those movies. 
uh, very successful. Um, but I, and, and, but what I didn't realize at the time when I would got excited about it was that I, I needed to leave school. Uh, I was, I was terribly depressed and it wasn't until I got out that I realized that. And, and, and it wasn't until I got out that I realized partially why. And when I realized I got, I got pretty angry. And, and what I realized is that acting school, uh, the way it, the way acting is taught, I don't know if it's only in America, but certainly the way it's taught in America, I, I think is a, a class action lawsuit waiting to happen. Tell me. Because they are doing almost by its nature, they're, they're, they're doing psychological work that they are not qualified to mm -hmm. do. Um, so acting teachers, you know, uh, I, by virtue of the fact that they are in this powerful position of of being your, it's a combination of guru. things. Yeah. yeah, they they a lot of them set themselves up as gurus, intentionally or not. I think a lot of them fall into that trap. Mm. And the work, because it is so rooted in this, in the method, um, which involves a lot of psychological work and they are teaching and I'm, I'm, I'm doing air quotes, but you can't see them. And I'm not even, and Lana can't even see them because I'm not actually doing them, but I'm doing them vocally because, because there's so much psychological work in the method, which relies on using sense memory and, right. and, and deep emotional pain to access things. Um, they feel like they have to sort of get into your psyche. I'm now deeply skeptical of of that kind of teaching and i feel like they they are just do they're just doing work they're not qualified to do and it's and 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 because i was so eager to be an actor and to be a good student like right, i went as, please them. i went as deep into it as i was capable of uh and i didn't really have the emotional tools to to deal with that well when i was in an acting studio not not exactly the same scenario as you, but I was in an, an acting studio where it was a sense memory class and people would come in and um, it was just one traumatic event after another and it became very competitive, it right? Like competitive. who could have the most? Right. And I was like, I got nothing. Like grew up in Teaneck, <laughs> like the most loving family, parents right. still together, went from, you know, middle class happiness, Broadway shows to celebrate our birthdays. Um I had once been on a horse and thought, like, oh, I might fall off the horse. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. But I went in and, like, literally there was this one girl doing an exercise where she kind of showed the whole class how she would come home from her day in present day. This wasn't even, like, back mm -hmm. in her childhood. And as a, a grown person would, like, take off her, you know, clothes of the day and get into her pajamas and go into her fridge and she had like set it all up with the props and furniture in the room using cubes and stuff but she had brought in her own prop that none of us had seen and then at the end of like all of the stuff she did she took a baby bottle out from behind you know the groceries she had put in the fridge and sat on the couch and drank from a baby bottle mm. I had to go after that <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? I once threw my friend's doll in the pool because I was jealous of the doll. But like, ah. And uh, I ended up like recreating the the horse thing. But like in mine, like I fell off and I broke a leg and, the, you know. You were just lying. EM got like, I mean, everyone was like amazing. Right. So that's when I was like, oh, it can be true. Mm-hmm. Or it doesn't have to be true. Mm -hmm. But if I believe in it, mm -hmm. um, I can fool everybody. And that's why I have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's, but, you know, I have friends who run. I don't know if when you were at NYU, you could kind of choose which studio. Do they yeah. have that back then? Yeah. you. I mean, yeah, you, to a certain extent, you could choose. I mean, I definitely chose the studio I was in. I expressed an interest right. in the studio that I was in. I have friends who run in New York City, the Atlantic Theater Company, and they also have a school and and the whole premise of that studio and school, which was born out of David, kind of the brainchild of David Mamet and and Bill Macy, um, is just say the words. It's it's actually the exact opposite of that. Like we've mm -hmm. given you a map, 
Right. So if you say the words, actually, please don't act. Right. And some people love, you know, the world of Mamet and some people don't. But it, it it's kind of a terrific response to exactly what you're talking about. I have been watching a lot of Mamet lately. Uh, he does this master class mm-hmm. and I, I bought the master class. So that's a real thing. It's not only a real thing. Malcolm Gladwell and Annie Leibovitz and yeah. Steve Mar all these people. I'm I've like, do re- I put my quarters in right. the slots? How much of a sucker am I? Yeah. I I there were enough people doing them that I was my interest was peaked thing. enough. Yeah. That I, I signed up for the whole kit and caboodle. Because you can sign up for one for you like can ninety sign bucks. Up for kit or, or caboodle. caboodle. <laughs> I signed for the kit and caboodle. Amazing. Hundred and eighty bucks gives you access to all of them. And so I started watching, and I, w- I, w- I, w- I, w- I was watching uh, Mamet and Aaron Sorkin, and I've started, started the Helen Mirren one, and, uh, and they're great. They're really great. I mean, you take what you, what you want from them. Um, well, I started writing just watching the Malcolm Gladwell trailer. I was like, got it. What? You had your 10,000 hours just from watching. <laughs> 10,000 seconds. Exactly. <laughs> Done. Um, and... and I knew everything about you when you sat down. It yes. all in the first minute blink. Yeah. You blinked, and that was it. Air quotes, not. Uh, these chairs have. Uh, in the beginning, I had almost reached my tipping point because mm. of the chairs. Malcolm, but that's a Malcolm we salute Tidewell you. reference. We salute you, New Yorker magazine. <laughs> uh, but so when in I was watching younger, Mamet when and I was these younger, I had a I had a a, a visceral anti reaction or I guess a visceral reaction, but a negative one towards Mamet, because it just felt like it was such a knock on actors. I have since come to uh, feel otherwise. Well, you took the master class. I took the master class. Now I have mastered acting. Um, I don't I don't believe, I'm not all there with him, but I think there's a lot of truth in what he says. Well, he's all there with you, so you Did should he say know that. Oh my that... God. Did he say that? It's a little embarrassing. Did David say that? It was just here. Oh, my God. So he took your master class. I'm, like, blushing. Well, if you had a master class in comedy, mm, writing, mm. and improvising, mm-hmm. you came up at a time uh, where suddenly places like Comedy Central existed. Mm-hmm. And and so SNL wasn't sort of the only choice for someone who wanted to do comedy to dream of one day being on that. Suddenly... The thing that is so impressive to me about you is that you found ways not just to be a Ninja Turtle early on in your career, which some people, that's kind of what happens at the end, (laughs) if you think about it. A lot of people get into this game to end up being a Ninja Turtle. I started as a Ninja Turtle. Yeah. To get into every other thing. I do feel like, I think it was Laura Linney who was here. I think she really was recently in a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle film. And I was like, okay. Why not? Why not, Laura Linney? Check, done the everything. check clears. Exactly. But so, Kate, my case in point, you, in fact, started there. How did this, was Was Stella first? No. No, the, what was the beginning? The State. The State. Was my sketch comedy show. And you started that with I, some friends? Yes. Or they invited you in? No, it was all, well, it, it we all kind of started it together my freshman year at NYU. Um, but it was the brainchild of one of our members named Todd Hollebeck. Um, and yeah, we ended up with our own show on MTV. Well, that's an incredible thing because really at that time there was real world. Right. And and there wasn't a lot of original comedic no. content happening. So, I mean, depression, they do say, is great for comedy. So maybe it was good that you were not a happy freshman. Mm, no. No, I was miserable. I'm so sorry, and I'm just, I shouldn't have even kidded about that. Yeah, we, we, you you should have either issued a trigger warning that you were going to make a joke right. to me, right? Or a spo- even a spoiler alert would have been helpful. What is what is a trigger warning? This might you, do you just say this might trigger you? Yeah, I think that's what you say. Just a, a, a attention listeners, you know, uh, in the next few seconds, I'm about to make a joke about depression. That some of you may find very distasteful. I'm going to do even better. I'm just going to edit the whole thing out. <laughs> no. We're, look, we're very funny together. This is all very funny. But. There's no but. It might, no, but there's someone in Iowa might not think so. Well, if they don't, they can go fuck themselves. <laughs> right? Not Iowa as a state. No, 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 no. Just that, just that isolated 
depressed person who who's going to it. take offense. Yeah. And all I'm trying to do is cheer them up. That's right. That's what you're here for. So you got, had you done comedy? Had you done stand-up before you got to school? Because you're very young. Not much stand-up could have happened already. Oh, I didn't do any stand-up. All right. But you knew you were funny and you could make people laugh. Yeah, kind of. Uh so the state was sketch. It really wasn't stand up. And, and, and the difference is we would write every, you know, we were writing little scenes and performing them. I didn't really start doing stand up till much later. Uh, and I only, st- I started doing it because I had gotten to a place where people kind of knew who I was and I was starting to get offers to do it. And it had been something that I always wanted to try, but I was afraid it's terrifying. Terrifying. Yeah. And so I thought it's kind of now or never. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to, as they say now, lean into this. Good for you. Remember when you described earlier being nine and kind of you were on stage and then you fell and then you recovered and they loved you for it and you loved yourself because of it. Do you feel that way with stand up? No. What's that? What's that thing? Well, first of all, um, I don't know. I don't know that I've ever recaptured that moment that I had when mm-hmm. I was nine. Maybe on your wedding night. <laughs> no, we were exhausted and it's the worst. Starving and got takeout diner food. Got and, it. And, got and it. And fell asleep. Nice. Um, no, stand up for me is is. Uh, it, it, the closest thing that I can think of that it's like is going to the gym. I mean, it is such a workout, uh, sometimes even physically. Um, Do you like going to the gym or the feeling of when you've done the gym and then more, you're like, I yeah. just worked out? It's more I, I like having worked out or I like having written. Um, there are moments, or not even moments, there are shows where you 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 feel just great and like you're just kind of floating but a lot of times it's not a, it's not that it's a slog it, it, it's that it's it's a lot of concentrated effort and uh i'm not a young man anymore do you write your own material oh, by yeah, yourself yeah, yeah 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 so also it's such a different solitary experience because you started out working with friends mm-hmm. you made each other laugh and then lo and behold other people enjoyed it too yeah. which is just icing on the cake um so that's probably, is this the only thing that you do? And you write by yourself, obviously, when you write your books. But mm-hmm. you're out there by yourself. That's scary. It is scary. It's less scary now than it used to be. It's it's scary in a different way for me. It's scary because it's it, it, I'm perpetually in a moment of, like, is this as good as I get at this? Can I... How do I find, or is that the last joke I ever wrote? Like, uh, uh, am I ever going to find another joke? Am I ever going to find another premise? Am I ever going to, like, figure this out in a more cohesive, uh, deeper way than what I feel like I'm doing in that moment? So, and writing's the same, I guess. You know, I, I it's hard for me to feel terribly uh, confident or comfortable with what I'm doing and I wish I did I wish I I wish I felt better about it well I was thinking in in you know when you said earlier that I I researched you I I did and I do um I'm researching you right now and I I feel like and I do find it rude that you've been on your phone this entire (laughs) time well I was thinking about how it can be um I guess my fantasy of you is extremely confident because you say things out loud, either on Twitter or talk shows or in other interviews, that you really feel about politics and the world and people. Um, And you are willing to stick your neck out for the things that you believe in or even just to get the dialogue going. When did you feel like, okay, I can do this? First of all, people are listening to you. You have many followers. How come you have so many followers? Did you buy them? Uh, no. In a sense, yes, but not literally. But, but well, how do you? Well, uh, it, it's... It, for, okay. So I have two million something followers on Twitter. I can tell you that that number is 
uh, both nonsense and meaningless. It happened because I joined Twitter right before Twitter took off. Uh -huh. And I was one of the earlier comedians who I feel like was using the platform well. The, and did you just intuit? Like, yeah, this is going to be a good I just thing kind of and my voice it. works in 20 yeah. cards? Yeah. I think I just kind of got it very intuitively. And so Twitter had this thing when they were experiencing their exponential growth where certain people, essentially, if you were interested in comedy, like I would just appear on your feed. That's where that number comes from. Uh -huh. It has, you know, that growth uh, of like, you know, tens and tens of thousands of followers coming all the time. That, 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 that has... Uh, not existed for me in a very long time. So that number, it's a totally artificial number. No, I never bought any followers, but I may as well have. Right. But people are engaged with you. I mean, you see, yeah. you know when someone bought followers because they have 2 million followers and seven people liked the thing they right. wrote, right? right? So there's a major disconnect between right. the those two worlds. But obviously people are really engaged with you and you engage with them. I do. Does it take up a lot of your time yeah, where you should be doing other yes, things? Yes. So how do you handle that? I don't. I don't handle it well. I mean, it's my ultimate procrastination tool. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you the number of years I have thrown away uh, responding to... <laughs> That's where your uh, 10,000 hours went. Yeah. And, and, and yet I seem to be getting worse at Twitter, not better. Um, do you tell your kids to get off their phones? Hmm... It would be so hypocritical. Well, sure, but that's what parenting is right. generally. <laughs> it's primarily. That's what my book is. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, not really. My kids, are, I mean, my daughter is on more than me, but she's usually just binging a television show on her phone. It's not Snapchat or No, sort of, yeah. I mean, she's on Snapchat, but I don't feel like she's constantly Obsessive. on Snapchat. Yeah. What do you think about technology in general? Do that's you a think very it's broad a question, value Alana. add? For you personally? For me personally, it's a, you know what? I think, yes, yes. I think Twitter overall specifically has been a value add for me. In uh, what ways? Well, I've gotten jobs from Twitter. Uh, I've certainly reached people from Twitter. In some ways, I have found a voice that I didn't have on Twitter. Um but the downside is the downside that you think it 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 is time consuming it is addictive um and you you run the risk of being performative in your opinions mm -hmm. uh and i try to be aware of that and on guard for that and at least it look everything you do in public and sometimes in private is performative to a certain extent I try to be at least aware of why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and kind of how I'm doing what I'm doing when I'm doing it. And I, I don't know that I always succeed, but I'm, I'm, I'm at least trying to be aware. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip back a, a moment to the beginning of this specific chapter of our conversation, which was MTV. Uh -huh. and, and that must have been thrilling to get a job that wasn't in a turtle outfit, mm -hmm. I imagine. Yes, it was considerably less smelly than and being in a turtle And with friends, outfit. more friends. Yes, uh, yes. although uh, my turtle friend was also, was also in the state. Yeah. Yes, and I hope you're still friends with him because mm -hmm. he's doing very well. And maybe he can Throw put you in more stuff. Way. Yeah. Yes. I'm, oh, he, he did put me in something. He what? put me in Hell Baby, that, that thing you mentioned. I that's think I'm, right. in, I'm in Hell Baby for mm. maybe a minute and a half. But that's really nice of him. <laughs> it was really nice of him. Because a lot of people, anyone could have... You know, he had other friends and sure. he chose you. Sure, sure. So tell, take me through a little bit this um, this ensemble that you created and those relationships generated other jobs and other work and more and a way to support yourself. Yes. Have so, you ever not supported yourself since then? No. That's incredible. Um, that is incredible. And I don't take that for granted. I mean, I, I have been very fortunate, very lucky, um, uh, because, you know, there were any number of sketch comedy troops all over the country who just as easily could have gotten that show on MTV and done just as, as well. Right. But um, the state got it. But we, we happened to luck into it. Um, and it was incredible 
to be 2021 20, with, you know, a TV show, a TV show on a, a hot, network. Hot, hot, hot. Yeah. Um, but there's no, there is a, I mean, how but long it, did you but, do it for? Uh, uh, three, two and a half, three years or something. And then we fucked it up so bad. Why? It would have fucked up anyway, because it was, there were 11 of us, which is an ungodly number for that kind of work. And there was no leader. It was all very democratic. And as, and, and so a lot of tensions arose and, yeah. and we were, you know, young and not emotionally mature enough to handle those tensions uh, and I think we did a we did as good a job as we could have in terms of managing egos and and trying to be fair and but but it was impossible um, and it would have imploded sooner rather than later. Um, How did it actually end? Like, what was the end? Well, it kind of fizzled. What happened was we were on MTV for a while and we were starting to get attention, and the networks were starting to call, and ABC basically said, we want to put you on against SNL. And we were like, yeah, let's do that. Um, and so we we were making this deal with ABC, and the next thing we knew, the deal had fallen apart, and there was no deal. And then CBS was like, well, we'll do something with you. And we're like, all right. And we ended up on CBS doing a series of, we were supposed to do a series of specials at a time when like Murder, She Wrote was like their biggest hit. Like we had no business being right. on CBS. Right, not we, exactly the same audience. It was not the same audience, but you know, they were like, well, we want to get younger, which, you know, they've been saying. Since, since, since then. <laughs> since probably 30 years before that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so we did one special, we did a Halloween special and it was like the lowest rated thing on TV that week. Um, right, so it made no sense. It made no sense. And then the next day we were basically fired and then it was like, uh, I don't know. I don't know what's next. So how long after that did you get Ed? Oh. Uh, Is that many years later or well, not that long after? Well, uh, I did a show called Viva Variety after the state. And then that was a few years. And then I went out to L.A. for like a year and a half where I was kind of messing around. And then I came. I decided I didn't want to be in L.A. and I came back and... Ed kind of fell into my lap. You right didn't audition? That. It wasn't like pilot no, season? No, I auditioned. And you, I auditioned yeah, but, but you got it. Yeah, I got it. And that went on for years? That went on for four years. Yeah. So when you when did you start writing? How did writing children's books and, and sort of memoirs, and how did you move into also writing? Because the state was a sketch comedy troupe, we had to generate material, and if you wanted to be in something, it was best if you wrote it because the writer was responsible for casting. Uh huh. So you're like, I think Michael Ian Black would be very good. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, that's what happened. Yeah. So it was very, it was the state was always very competitive, um, and if if they if the group liked your sketch. You know, it was kind of understood that you would be the star of it. But on SNL, I mean, when you said it was sort of like, you know, communism or socialism, maybe. Which it, was it? It was somewhere in the middle. It was. It was more of a pure democracy. Okay. The, there's a Lauren. My there in other shows. There's right. someone. There's the creator. Right. There's the boss person. Right. And you all pitch that person, right. or you pitch, like when you're doing what you're doing. How did any of these? Was there a net? Was there an MTV person there? There was, but that's it. it it, we kind of were, we kind of bullied the executives. I mean, they left, they we, were like, you know what, they're going to do their own kind thing. Of. And... We were sort of a force of nature. We were hard to deal with, which was a good thing, I think, uh, from our perspective. But it, it was, it was simple. Like every day at two, you'd come in with whatever material you had. We'd read it out loud. Uh, and then at the end of the day, at the end of that session, we'd vote. And, you know, if you got votes, your sketch would kind of go on a board. Um, and we do it. So Michael Showalter, David Wayne, people who who my listeners will know who who like you have gone on to kind of create hilarious and different things. Mm -hmm. um, how did you guys all come together? What do you later? Mean? Oh, well, well then what... when Stella happens, right? A around the time that we were starting, that we were on MTV, 
there was a it it came to be called alternative comedy, but a kind of new comedy movement that was happening in L.A. And how would you describe we that York. movement? It was it was it was a, a very blatant rejection of everything that had kind of immediately preceded it. So that very Seinfeld esque observational stand up comedy, which uh, broke had, ground in that way, absolutely broke right? ground in that way, and and flourished for a little while in the eighties and into the early nineties, and then that whole scene just collapsed. And there were a lot of people in that world kind of looking around and going, well, what happens now? Mm-hmm. How do, what do we, where does comedy go from here? So in LA, this, this movement started percolating with people like Pat Oswalt and Janine Garofalo and uh, Dane Cook, I mean, not Dane Cook, um, Dana Gould and uh, Paul F. Tompkins and um, uh, Marilyn Rice Cub and, you know, and, and, and they were starting to experiment with storytelling or with conceptual things. And then a few people decided to start that in New York. And one of them is named Lisa Langang, and she's become a comedy executive since then. And she, I ran into her on the subway. She basically invited me to come start performing at this place called Rebar. And so... I did. It wasn't stand up. I mean, I wasn't doing stand up. I didn't really know what I was doing. Were you doing scenes? Or I was. was I was you, experimenting. I mean, you were one talking of, in front of people. Sometimes not even. Sometimes I was doing this kind of conceptual thing where I was interested in taking, um, like women shots. <laughs> Kind of. <laughs> I was I was interested in context. I was interested yeah. in like what could you take from the real world and bring it into a comedy context and have it be funny by virtue of the fact that it's in a comedy context. So like like, like okay, what? Uh, I'm I'm about Ilana, I'm about to give you an example. <laughs> oh, I'm just so excited. I used to like browsing on New York City streets. They'd have these guys like outside the 23rd Street flea market and they'd bring like blankets out and they just have this random shit out there like shoes or a cassette tape, you know, and you and or you know It was ties. hard to tell how it was curated. It was in, maybe not it, it a was lot hard of curating. To tell where it was curated and where exactly it came from. <laughs> right. And you would just sort of browse it and make an offer for a buck or something. So like one of the things that I did was I brought a blanket into rebar and I just took a bunch of my possessions and put them on the blanket and just stood there quietly until somebody said how much for the whatever. And I just started selling my things. Uh, and so it was, was funny. Like an installation. That like was kind art, of, yeah. that was as close to an art installation as like I've ever done. Yeah. You could bring that to MoMA and people would be like, oh, interesting. <laughs> I love what he is doing. <laughs> Maybe. But I did make like 15 bucks. So you would take money from the audience. Oh, I took the money. Yeah. I'm sure you did. I wasn't not going to take the money. That was part of the deal. Right. And, and part of the concept was, yeah, I will take your money. Right. Uh, that was one of the things that I did. I did this thing. One of my earliest things was like doing a sincere as sincere as i could exploration of what it, like what it would be like to be a cat and like sort of <laughs> see this is when i'm sad it's audio this um, oh i think we're filming oh we Great. are filming. could you <laughs> so like the piece was like i wonder what it would be like to be a cat what like what would it feel like to have whiskers and like doing that doing that as sincerely as i could and it was funny because it was so stupid. Um, but there was nothing inherently joke-filled about it. It wasn't stand-up in any real way. Um, the only joke was at the end where I asked the audience, how did the cat die? How did the cat die? And then inevitably somebody, or what killed the cat would kill the cat. And then somebody would say curiosity. I'd say, no, feline leukemia. Feline leukemia killed the cat. Thank you. And that was the end of the piece. And then the MC would be like, Michael Ian Black, everybody. <laughs> Basically, yeah. So it's like that kind of thing where it's not stand up. It's not, it's just, it's kind of ideas explored. And in a weird way, I'm trying to get back to that now. Not a weird way. And it's not weird at all. I am trying to get back to that a little bit. In be- your stand up. Yeah. Because I think. Or in your life. In my, more in my stand up than my life. Although a little bit in my life. Because I do we think. go to your house, there's a blanket <laughs> on the front lawn. <laughs> One broken ashtray. Well, when you look at the people on your show, How to Be Amazing. Oh, yeah, that show. Which is, I mean, a podcast is just one of many things Broderick that you have going on. 
No. Lenny hasn't done it. No. Yet. Not yet. Um, I am happy to share. Thanks. I am I am not a guest hoarder. I actually don't act, interview actors very often. No, but I'm excited that I'm coming on. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yo, yo, no, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That's, first of all, yeah. Um, that would be uh, a thrill just to, you know, do crafty for your podcast. <laughs> um, I feel like a lot of people ask me because I've done maybe not as many as you, but you you may be my hundredth interview. Oh, then so, you've done more than me. Okay, we're not we're not quite at a hundred yet. All right, so a lot, and and I think you know when I looked over your your roster of guests and and sort of all of the people you have on, and and it's every one of them has kind of accomplished something really significant in their chosen field, and every one of them worked really hard to make that happen. I would say a criteria for me is uh, to have artists on this show that I find inspiring, not just by their craft and and what they've accomplished, but also because they seem to have remained really good people at the same time. Um, Today is my, in honor of my hundredth episode, I've broken that rule. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just trying to think, like I've now had people who have been on my podcast, the reason I was making that reaction. Yeah, which, which they're also that, horrible. They're no, no, no. They were, everybody has been lovely, but then subsequently, at least a couple of them have like lost their jobs due to sexual Me harassment. Too. Think yeah. That's, yeah, that's why I was yeah. That's why I was sort of looking up at the sky and, and thinking about well, those Well, that's a guests. whole, I mean, that that is a whole other conversation. Do we stop reading, watching, listening to the artists who have created things, who have also done uh, not such great things in the workplace or in other parts of their lives? I, I lean on the side of, yes, we stop watching and reading and listening. Um, I, but my, I, my sense the, is there's, there's a timeout period. Yeah. There's a timeout period. Timeout during the time's up. Mm-hmm. Again, in Iowa, someone is very upset with me. <laughs> <laughs> but if we can't laugh, all we can do is cry. Um, but I bring this up because in, in, you know, why I had thought of how to be amazing is I keep trying to figure out I mean, we, we joke about Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. I think absolutely that's part of it. It's having the luck and the opportunity um, and the hours so that when this magical moment happens, and I don't mean this necessarily in the world of like YouTube artists and people who mm-hmm. you know are doing vlogs about what's in their purse and they're getting movies ahead of me because they have a lot of people who like to watch those vlogs and, and also, good for them. And also great stuff in their purses. Great stuff in there. And by the way, don't think I haven't bought many of those items based on their <laughs> recommendation. If you had to put together in all your your conversations, I'm still sort of the jury's out for me because I feel like this thing called, they call it Lady Luck, actually. The thing that, that is a part of all of these stories is luck, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's what makes some people uber successful, um, and other people doing just as you know beautiful work, and it's not crossing over in that way. But do you have as we as we come to a close for this conversation? Do you have sort of a takeaway? I mean, uh, Michael's podcast is interviewing all of these remarkable people in every walk of life who have created something that we know about because it's good and it's broken through in some way. Do you have a takeaway about why these people? Um, no. And look, a lot of them are really brilliant. Trust fund babies. <laughs> Some of them are. Absolutely. <laughs> they didn't buy that brownstone. They got it. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Some of them absolutely are trust fund babies. Most of them, I would say, are... There's a few things at play. Luck is certainly one of them. Part of it is persistence. I think persistence is one of the most undervalued traits. I don't even know that I believe in talent anymore um, in the sense that that talent is some magical gift that is you're either bestowed bestowed upon you or not. I think it's more that there's there you have an interest, you lean towards something and in that leaning you, move towards it with with a persistence that can be mistaken for talent. Some people are geniuses. I think we can throw those people out of this conversation. Um, I think you're a genius. Thank you. I, uh, I, I, you're joking. No, 
I, I mean, I, I, I just think you're so smart I'm and not. so funny oh and my God. so fast. Stop, 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 stop. But I do. I know I'm not. I know what a fool I am. Um, Geniuses can be fools. Sure. Uh, I know I'm not. And it's certainly not when I, when I look at the people or, or that, that, I, that I speak with fairly, you know, every so often. Well, they think you are too. Most of them don't know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> but their 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 PR person was like, he gets a lot of he. The download numbers are great. Go on the podcast, but it's going to kill you. You don't have to wear makeup. I think it's persistence more mm-hmm. than anything else. I think it is um, because some some people really believe in their work. Some people are are doubters. Some people uh, it happens for them early. Some people it happens for them late. Some people come from a certain kind of family. Some people come from a different kind of family. But I think the thing that they all have in common is persistence. And I I have come to believe more and more strongly in just the effortful practice of whatever it is you you want to do. So before we go, I don't know if you're offer only at this point. I'll do it. Whatever it is, I'll do it. Whatever it is, I'll do it. Do you have an audition story? from your life that comes to mind that that may be funny now but at the time or or maybe it was funny then um first of all as an actor i can tell i can probably count on one hand the number of jobs i've gotten from auditioning and i've been reminded of how unsuccessful i am at auditioning just these past few weeks when I find myself unemployed and perhaps forever unemployed and it happens to be pilot season. And I said to my agents, can I have some auditions for pilot season? And they said, we'll see what we can do. And, uh, I think I had three, four, Mm. nothing. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, not even like, Oh, we think he's really great. Let's Mm -hmm. bring him back. Nothing. No, nothing. Um, so you might have a humiliating audition story from yesterday. Uh, no, they're not even humiliating. It's just like, thank you. I think we got it. (laughs) Great. And the thing is like. Do you prepare for auditions? I I try, but I'm not a good. I'm not a good faker, which is weird to say as an actor, because that is your job. But if I'm sitting across from you, the casting director, yes. and you're looking at the piece of paper, yes. and we're in, we're like, we're at the law office, but we're not in a law office, and I'm driving a car, but I'm I'm not driving a car. Right. You're holding a gun, but right. I'm not holding a gun. Right, like yeah. none of that. Like I can't do that. I can't. I'm not saying, and I, and instantly, I wish I could. I wish I had that ability to be in that moment with you. In the fake, in the, in the fake, in the fake thing. Of it even all. though there's nothing, even though actual acting is so artificial. Anyway, but being there in the space with the person, ha- I can do that. I can stand there and on say the, the day, lines. Yes, on the set, I can't do it in a in a tiny closet with. You know, the the 19 year old assistant sort of watching the monitor as she's like pointing the camera at me. And I'm reading with the casting director. I just can't do it. I'm not, I'm just not good at it. So it's, it's infinitely frustrating to me um, that I'm not better at it. I blame nobody but myself. Mm. Um, but I do remember the, the, an embarrassing moment that I had when I was just starting out, maybe 19. And they were doing a production of... Uh, the Neil Simon play about the Bronx. Uh, about They're all the, about the Bronx. No. Broadway bound or. No, um, it was like the third in the trilogy of the Matthew Broderick. Yeah. Uh, Bueller. Yeah. It was after. Jerome. Jerome. Something like. Yeah. One the of those. Characters it was Jerome. one of those. Yes. And I think they were looking for like literally just like an understudy or something for the Broadway production. And I went in and read and it went really well. I knew it went really well. And. I got into the elevator afterwards and was just like so kind of elated that it went well that I just kind of freaked out in the elevator. And I, I like doing a happy dance. Yeah. And I got off the elevator and was walking out and I noticed that everybody was like laughing at me. And then I realized 
walking out that you, it, like there was monitors where you could see what was happening on the elevators. <laughs> And, and, of course, I didn't get the job. No, but you were <laughs> cast as Snoopy subsequently because that happy dance. Um, well, Michael Ian Black, I'm absolutely ecstatic that you came in today. Well, that's very kind of you, Alana. Uh, and I'm very happy to have been here. Mm. And if it really is the 100th, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I can make it anyone I want <laughs> I it to I think you be. should. If it, you can do better for 100. You can do a lot right. better. Well, uh, until next time, thank you for being here. Thank you.